Hey Econ 200, this week we're going over chapter three of the textbook, which is on supply and demand. Those three words, supply and demand, might be the most famous words in all of economics. Even people who have never taken an econ class are familiar with the phrase supply and demand. But most people who have never taken an economics course couldn't really define supply and demand for you or uh, tell you what those concepts mean in the context of economic analysis. And that's what we're going to get into uh, this week. Now, the, the topics supply and demand are actually very similar to each other. They're just kind of the reverse. Supply is what's happening among the sellers. Demand is what's happening among the buyers. And the reasoning for what happens on one side of the market is pretty much symmetrical to what's happening on the other side of the market. So we're going to deal with each of these concepts separately in this lecture. Uh, we'll put them together when we get to chapter four on equilibrium. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, them separately. Keep in mind, though, while we, we economists always use the term supply and demand, we always say supply first. Whenever we're explaining the concept of supply and demand, we almost always talk about demand first. So that's what we're going to discuss in this first series of videos. Later on, we'll talk about supply. So let's begin with a simple example of deriving demand for a very small market. Okay, I'm going to have six people in this market. And if we were in class, I would be doing this, um, you know, with, with you folks raising your hand as I call out different prices, whether or not you would be willing to purchase something or not. Uh, but for the purposes of this, this video lecture, uh, I'm going to just imagine that we've got six people in the market instead of 30 or 40, which is what I have in a, in a typical class. And we're going to imagine that these six potential consumers are all deciding whether or not to buy um, a, uh, a, a drink. Uh, let's call it, let's say a 16 ounce Coca-Cola. Okay. So I'm going to mention different prices and then I'm going to tell you We'll just imagine how many of these buyers would be willing to buy and how many of them would no would not be willing to buy at that price. I'm going to start with, um, with a relatively high price, high for uh, a can of soda, and then we're going to drop the price and see how many people would, uh, would purchase. So over here, I'm going to keep track of the price and the quantity demanded. That's why you have the D subscript, QD, the quantity demanded at each price. So again, these uh, possible consumers are thinking about buying a, uh, a single can of uh, 16 ounces of Coca-Cola. And let's imagine that the price that they would have to pay was $3. Okay, now at that price, let's say that nobody is willing to purchase a can. So everybody would be in this don't buy column. And that means the quantity demanded would be zero. No one is buying at that price. Now let's suppose that we drop the price by a dollar. Let's say we cut the price to $2. And at $2, maybe this consumer would now be willing to purchase a can. And let's say that consumer would now be willing to purchase a can as well. So at a price of two, the quantity demanded is the number of people in the buy column. We have two consumers or two cans we would be able to sell at a price of $2 each. Now let's say we cut the price to $1 and ask how many people would be willing to buy. Well, we know these two consumers, they're still willing to buy because if they would pay $2 for a can, they would definitely be willing to pay $1 for a can. So they're gonna stay in the buy column. And let's move this consumer and that consumer over. Let's say now they would be willing to buy a can if you only charge them $1 for it. So the total quantity demanded at that price of $1 is going to be four units. And now let's say that we made it free. Okay, we're just giving these cans away. Uh, and at that price of zero, these two consumers will say they would be willing to make the purchase. Okay, so you've got quantities demanded of zero, two, four, and six as we lower the price from $3 down to $0. All right, so we can put demand in a table like this, but economists usually prefer to analyze demand as a curve, not as a table. So let's take 
the table that we've we've written out before three dollars two dollars one dollar and zero and the quantities demanded and I'm gonna graph them on a uh, chart them on a graph with price on the y-axis and quantity on the x-axis okay so at a price of three dollars you have zero units that would sell so that that point goes right there three dollars and zero at a price of two dollars two units would sell so two units at two dollars and at a price of one dollar we would have four units selling it goes right about there at a price of zero dollars you would sell all six cans now we've got those four discrete points but you can imagine people buying a single unit you know three units five and maybe you know if we're not selling discrete cans of soda we're selling like gallons of soda or ounces of soda you could imagine people buying fractions of an ounce or fractions of a gallon so in that case you can just connect these dots and that gives you your demand curve for the product. Now you'll notice that the demand curve is downward sloping. You can get this downward slope by two different types of reasoning. One is the reasoning we used in this example where every consumer is thinking about buying a single unit and they have differences in taste. So whoever is willing to pay the most for the product, they're gonna show up at the top of the demand curve. And as you cut the price, people who would be willing to pay less for the product uh, are going to start showing up on the demand curve in terms of the quantity of units that are demanded, okay? Uh, but it doesn't have to be differences in taste. It can be that you're talking about some resource that could be put to multiple different uses. And uh, like your textbook talks about oil, the market for oil. You could also think about the market for say steel or some other commodity where there's lots of different things we could do for it. And if you only have a, a limited quantity, well, you're going to want to put that resource to the most highly valued uses first. So if instead of being a demand curve for Coca-Cola, if this was the demand curve for oil, then if you've only got a, a limited amount, then you're probably gonna want to use that oil to produce maybe jet fuel so that you can fly you know, business executives and the president, uh, the heads of state of different gov governments around and, and get them where they need to go. And if you have a bit more oil to go around, then you might use the, uh, the, the less, um, sorry, that extra, that extra oil for somewhat less valued uses, right? You might use it for more transportation for individual workers or to, to transport goods and services around. And as the price of, of oil goes lower and lower, you're going to start using it for even less valuable uses. Eventually, you know, you use oil for petroleum products like rubber. So rubber duckies, technically speaking, are involved in the market for oil. You're only going to want to uh, to put oil towards the production production of rubber duckies once you've already filled up the more highly valued uses of oil that you can find. So that's the other way you can get a downward sloping demand curve. And you can just think about it as sort of organizing the highest valued uses from the lowest valued uses. Okay. Now there are two different ways that you can read a demand curve. One is that you can take a price and plug that price per unit into the demand curve. So if I take a price of $2, I just draw a straight line over from the $2 point on the y-axis. Wherever that hits the demand curve, I draw a straight line down and that tells me the quantity of units quantity demanded the quantity of units demanded at this price so one way of reading it is take the price plug it in and get a quantity the consumers would demand and the other way to read it is the reverse is to take a, a given quantity 
plug that into the demand curve and figure out what price consumers would pay if you were selling that many units. Okay, so the first way of reading it would basically be saying, well, I want to charge a price of $2 per unit. How many units could I sell if I charge that price? And the demand curve would tell you, well, you can sell two units at that price. Okay, the other thing that you could do is you could be saying, well, I have two units that I want to sell. If I, if I sell both of them, what's the highest price I could charge so that consumers would still be willing to buy both? So if you take that quantity demanded of two, you plug that into the demand curve, it will tell you if you charge a price of $2 per unit, you'll still be able to sell both of two, those two units. And you, you, you know, obviously you could still sell those two units at a lower price, but there's no point in doing that if you're a seller. And if you charge a price any, any amount above $2 per unit, you're not gonna be able to sell both of the units that you want to sell. Now this, by the way, brings up an important, an important distinction uh, in our, our concept of demand. Usually, when people talk about demand, like if, you're, if you are reading a newspaper article and they might say demand for oil was 50,000 barrels yesterday. Notice that that is talking about demand as a specific quantity of units that people want to buy. But in strict terms, strict economic terms, demand is not a single quantity. A single quantity is always called quantity demanded. Which is different than the idea of demand. So quantity demanded is plug in a price and you'll get a quantity that consumers want to buy. But demand is not any single quantity of units. Demand is this entire curve. It's the whole relationship between every price that I might want to charge and the quantity of units that consumers would demand at that price, okay? So keep that in mind. Demand never refers to a quantity of units. It always refers to the relationship between price and quantity. This is demand. These are quantities demanded. In the next video, we're going to talk about how we can use demand to organize our thinking about the amount by which consumers are made better off when they, uh, when they make purchases, which is also known as consumer surplus.